this talk is about network theory and it's about um, how people interact. It's based on research by Chris Darkis and Fowler in their book Connected. Um, how do groups of people interact? Networks are made up of groups of people and why do groups of people behave in a certain way? What is a group of people? A group can be defined by an attribute like long distance runners or Democrats or uh, women, men, or is a specific collections of individuals uh, to whom we can literally point. You know, people waiting to go in a concert, people in a queue. Um, so people can, can be connected by chance or by interests. What is a network? A network is different to a group. It includes something more, a particular set of connections between people in the group. These connections or ties and a particular pattern of these ties are often more important than the individual people themselves. The rules of the life in the network. There are two main aspects of social networks. There's connection, who is connected to who. Connections can be accidental or intense, personal or, personal or anonymous, temporary or lifelong. So connections as in this, you know, these three are connected through this shot, this shot by artist Tina Barney, they're connected through family. There is contagion uh, relating to what flows across the connections. It could be information or money or germs or violence, it could be fashion, happiness, obesity, etc. We shape our network and we shape it according to the idea of homophily, which is the tendency to associate with people that are like us. We seek out the people that share our interests, histories and aspirations. We choose the structure of the network in three important ways. We decide how many people we are connected to. Shot uh, by Larry Clark here from Tulsa. We influence how densely internet interconnected our friends and family are. Uh, we control how central we are to the social network and you know, the people that we hang out with. You know, why do we end up hanging out with them? We may know a few hundred people, but only a few will, will, we will be close to. The average adult has about four close contacts, and this is called a core discussion network. Those with a college degree have a network twice as large as other people. And it's interesting to look at this in the image by Massimo Vitali of a beach in Italy, seeing how the people congregate and who's sitting with who. Some people have lots of friends that know each other. The the term that Christarchus and Fowler use is high transitivity, transitivity. Others have lots of friends from different groups. This is called low transitivity. Those with low transitivity tend to act as a bridge between, between groups. You can think about maybe someone that you know that, that, that does that. And don't worry about the word, it's kind of sort of very technical term. Our networks shape us. Our place in a network affects, affects us. You know, in this instance, maybe these children in relation to these adults here. And there's a photograph by Martin Parr from the Nonconformists. Being in the centre of a network makes you more susceptible to what is flowing within the network, whether gossip or germs, for instance. Having extra friends can create uh, benefits for your health or broader, better prospects of hearing out, uh, about a job opportunity, even if the other person doesn't actually do anything for you, you know, directly. Our friends affect us. What actually flows across the connections is crucial. Social networks transport all kinds of things from one person to another. One fundamental aspect of this is the flow, is the tendency of this flow, is the tendency of human beings to influence and copy one another. Each and every tie to different people offers opportunity to influence and be influenced. Our friends' friends affect us. It turns out that people don't only copy their friends, they copy their friends' friends. And the friends' friends' friends. This tendency to be affected by beyond affected beyond an individual's direct social links runs counter to the way we think about contagion. 
that if one person has something and comes into contact with another person, that is that contagion spreads. For instance, um, the Milgram sidewalk experiment, 1968, positioned crowds ranging from 1 to 15 in size. They would stop and look up at point at something. When one person stopped and looked up, only 4% of people stopped. When a crowd did it, 40% stopped. Evidence that the decision to copy a behaviour was influenced by the size of the crowd exhibiting that behaviour. The network has a life of its own. Social networks can have qualities and ways of working that the people in them don't control or even notice. These qualities can be understood only by looking at the whole group and its structure, and not by looking at individuals. In a Mexican way, people respond spontaneously at a rate of about 20 seats per second, almost always in a clockwise direction. The three degrees of influence rule. Everything we do or say has an impact on our friends, one degree, our friends' friends, two degrees, and even our friends' friends' friends, three degrees. Our influence has less effect on people beyond three degrees of separation. Also, we're generally influenced by, by friends within three degrees, but generally not by those beyond. It can apply to a wide variety of views or politics, it can weight gain or happiness, etc. As part of our evolution, we appear to have evolved in small groups where everyone is connected to everyone by three degrees or less. This still means that we can reach a huge number of people. Word of mouth tend to spread uh, in terms of three degrees as well. We are aware of how we affect those that are close to us, but we rarely think about everything that we say, think, feel or do can spread far beyond the people we know. For instance, when uh, this is illustrated in Wuthering Heights, when Heathcliff overhears something, Kathy's, or half overhears something, Kathy's supposed to have said about him. Social networks have value because they help us achieve what we could not achieve on our own. They influence the spread of joy or, or help um, find sexual partners. It's not always positive. Uh, these social networks tend to exaggerate what is flowing through them. A social network network is like a commonly owned forest. This is Starker's and Fowler's point. We all stand to benefit from it, but we must always also work together to ensure it remains healthy and productive. This mean, means that social networks need looking after by individuals, groups and institutions. Also, if you're richer or healthier than others, it may be a lot to do with where you are in the network. A person with many friends may become rich and then attract more friends and the rich get richer sort of dynamic. Emotions show in four ways. We know them, we are aware, i.e. we know when we are happy, and we show them in our faces, with our body language and posture, etc. Say if you see a scary image, the blood flow to structures deep in your brain instantly changes, and they're shown in physical behaviours, shrieking, crying, laughing, etc. Experiments have shown that people can catch emotional states. They observe in others in time frames ranging from seconds to weeks. It can take place with strangers after even fleeting contact. For instance, waiters are trained to provide service with a smile. The customer feels more satisfied and they leave better tips. People's emotions and moods are affected by the people they interact with. Early humans had to rely on each other for survival. Their intentions with the elements are also tempered by their social interactions. Humans bonded with, e with e each other to be able to face the world more effectively. The development of emotions, the display of emotions and the ability to read emotions uh, of others help coordinate group activity in three ways, by making friends, synchronising behaviour and communicating information. Emotions may be a quicker way to convey information about the environment around you and its relative safety or danger that are better than other forms of communication. And it seems certain that emotions precede language. What emotions lack in specificity they make up for in speed. You can tell if someone is angry with you, but it can take a long time for them to explain why they are angry. Emotional, emotional contagion. Emotions spread from person to person for two reasons. We are biologically 
hardwired to mimic others outwardly and in mimicking their outward displays we come to adopt their inward status. Wherever we are, we tend to synchronise outward expressions, recognising the emotions of others. It's probably a key step towards synchronising feeling and behaviour and developing emotional empathy. Emotions show on faces and evolved as a way to communicate with others. We're able to tell straight away when someone is feeling disgust or fear, for instance. Human, humans have an extraordinary knack to detect even small changes in facial expression. And you can see uh, um, Gregory Crewton often plays with that idea with his uh, large scale photographic images. This ability is located in a particular area of the brain and is developed as a key step on the way to synchronizing feelings and developing emotional empathy that underlies the process of emotional contagion. There's another theory here Affectic, affective afference, facial feedback theory it's called. People imitate the facial expressions of others and as a direct result they come to feel as others. Uh, the mirror neuron system. One thing that might make emotions and behaviour contagious. Our brains practice doing actions we merely observe in others as if we were doing them ourselves. The influence of happy friends. Research has shown that unhappy people cluster with more un with other unhappy people in a network and vice versa. Unhappy people seem to be more peripheral. They are much more likely to appear at the end of a chain of social relationships or at the edge of a network. The cause for this might be happy people might choose each other as friends or be exposed to the same environments that cause them to be ha all to be happy at the same time. But the causal effect of happiness is one person's happiness on another's. A person is about 15% more likely to be happy if directly connected uh, to a person when degree separated is happy. So having happy friends seems to be a more effective predictor of happiness than earning more money. Even people who, who you have never met can have a stronger impact on your personal happiness than lots of money in your pocket. Once we control for the emotional states in one happy friend, having more friends isn't enough. Uh, Having more happy friends is the key to our emotional well-being. Each happy friend a person has increases that person's probability of being happy by about 9%. Each unhappy person decreases it by 7%. The closer happy friend lives to you, it can increase your happiness by 25%, more than a mile away, and it's not. And, and happy next door neighbours increase your happiness, where neighbours that live further away they have no significant effects. The more friends you... The more friends your friends have, the more likely you are to be happy. This suggests the importance of proximity among people whose emotions influence one another. And the impact of immediate neighbours suggests that the spread of happiness may depend as much on frequent face-to-face -face interaction as deep personal connections. Being near a familiar person can have effects as diverse as lowering heart function, improving immune, immune function and reducing depression. Spouses provide social support to each other and connect each other to the broader social network of friends, neighbours and relatives. People imitate each other. When people are free to do as they please, they usually imitate. This is a quote from Eric Hoffer. Imitation can both be something we intentionally think about and a physical and a natural process. A norm. What spreads from one person to spreads from person to person is, is a shared expectation of what is appropriate. It's called a norm. So in this instance, you can see in the Lisa Safati photograph, people smoking together. People can reinforce particular norms so that directly and indirectly connected people share an idea about something without realising that they are being influenced by one another. Our health depends on our own biology, our own choices and actions, but also on other people's biology, choices and actions. Network and creativity. In a study of theatre companies, research found that teams made up of individuals that had never worked for each other before fared badly, increasing the chances of a flop. These networks are not well connected and contain mainly weak ties. At the other extreme, groups that had all worked together previously also did badly. It's because they lacked creative input from the outside. They rehashed the same ideas. The companies that did best had a mix of new people and the stability of previously formed relationships. 
direct reciprocity. If you have several opportunities to cooperate with the same person, one way to get that person to help you is to promise future co cooperation. Robert Axelrod showed that a cooperative strategy called tit for tat often is more effective than always cooperating or always being selfish. In tit for tat, you, you cooperate the first time you meet someone and thereafter simply copy what that person did the last time you interacted with them. Uh, Christakis and Fowler have also um, identified three kinds of ways of operating in a social network. Um, uh, cooperators, free riders and punishers. Uh, cooperation can emerge because we can do more together than we can apart. But because of the free rider problem, cooperation is not guaranteed to succeed. To deal with free riders, another type of person is needed, punishers. So, you know, uh, the, ide the idea that in in the studios that everyone cooperates with each other. Free riders connect in order to, to leech off those who create and punishers connect in order to drive away free riders. Because we're connected to others and because we've we've evolved to care about others, we take the well-being of others into account when we make choices about what to do. The reason any co cooperation arises between people is incentive compatible. I scratch your back because I think you are going to scratch mine. In 1993, Dunbar examined the relationship between brain size and group size in a variety of primates and worked out that according to our brain size, the expected size of the social group for humans should be about 150. Animals can't do this. Dunbar points out that uh, Dunbar's point was that a group was the, the largest number of humans where every member knows every other member. This is the number of people you recognise and are able to maintain a stable and coherent relationship with. He tested this idea out by researching historical groupings like hunter-gatherers or near Neolithic villages and the average size for a band or village is 148. Also the Schmiedelet Hutterites who live in Canada, a community in northern USA and Canada regard a community of 150 to be the limiting size. Bigger than this and the community is intentionally split. They found that above this number is the maximum group size where peer pressure alone works. Bigger than that and you need a police force and a more hierarchical structure. Dunbar predicted how long primates like chimpanzees would have to spend time grooming each other in this large group size of 150 to maintain social connections and cohesion. They would have to spend 42% of their time grooming each other. He argued that language emerged among humans in, in part to replace grooming. Obviously language is yes, less yucky uh, and it's more efficient as a way to get to know your peers uh, as we can talk to several people at once but only groom one person at a time. Dunbar estimates that language would have to be would have to be about 2.8 times more efficient than grooming to maintain the group size seen in humans. Hence, he estimates that the human conversational group should be about four people, one speaker and 2.8 listeners. In fact, with a small group, we can assess the behaviour, health, aggressiveness and altruism, altruism being the uh, drive to do right, of several individuals simultaneously through talking to each other. We gain more than we lose by living in social networks. Altruism, kindness and selflessness is a is a key ingredient for the formation and operation of a social network. If people were never to be altruistic, never reciprocated kind behaviour, or worse, were always violent, then social ties would disintegrate. Uh, the surprising of us aspect of social networks is not just the effects of what affects us, but what effect we have on each other. What we don't realise is the level of impact we have on each other. We have a much bigger impact on others than we can see.